Thanks, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> so, as Craig said, I'm Mike Blumford. I'm from Investment Trends. I think most people in the room here know of us. If you don't, the very short version is that we're a wholly independent market research firm specialising in the financial services industry. And we work with almost all the brokers, uh, almost all of the issuers of, of product in Australia, the people who sell product, distribute product, house product, build technology to house product and so on. And so that's who we are. I'm going to talk to you for uh, something like 15 minutes about what we're seeing emerging as a set of trends in the ETF market. But to do that, I want to start at the start. And, and for us in many ways, and I do think for our industry in many ways, the start is the investor. None of this product has much role in the absence of an investor. And so I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about the return expectations of retail investors of, in Australia right now and also about the return expectations of their financial planners. What I'm going to do here is show you that over a series of time, uh, the dark blue line it may not surprise you to realise that planners have higher return expectations almost throughout history. And the green line is retail investors. Uh, and in the background, we have the, uh, <coughs> the All Ordinaries Index. So what do we see? Well, we see a couple of things. Number one is that over the course of the last uh, really four or five years, the return expectations of financial planners have softened. And this is ex-div, I should be very clear about that. And it is not to understate the importance of dividends in, in, in the role of uh, portfolio management in Australia. But this is ex-div. So over time we've seen this gradual decrease in the return expectations of planners. And we've seen an equally uh, large decrease in the return expectations of retail investors. But we've also seen another thing happening here, which is that retail investors' return expectations looking out forward for the next 12 months have actually become increasingly volatile over the recent years. And the reason for that is that below all of this, they have concerns about the global economy and about big issues in the global economy. So what I've done here for you is we go out every month and we measure the concern levels among, this is online investors in Australia, this is a good representative sample. And we ask them about how they're feeling about things and I'll, I'll tell you about some of the things in a second. What you can see is that two things. Number one is that we have a current number of uh, 5.7. This is on a scale of 0 to 10, naught, lying on the beach, possibly having a margarita, 10, standing on the edge of a building ready to jump. They're the sort of differential in concern levels. We're at a 5.7. Anything over 5 is not great, but you can see that uh, back around 2011 it got very high. So these are relatively high concern levels in a relatively low return uh, expectation environment. But more importantly is what's behind this. And so if what was behind these concern levels was things like the unemployment rate, or things like uh, interest rates, uh, these sort of microeconomic and macroeconomic but relatively um, uh, non-cataclysmic issues, then all would not be so bad. But the problem that we have at the moment is the big three issues that worry retail investors in Australia, and, and by the way, in the seven other countries that we survey, the data is pretty similar. Uh, the things they're worried about are, number one, another GFC, quote unquote. Uh, number two, uh, we designed this very elegant phrase. I hope you'll understand, Craig, uh, forgive me. It's, the phrase is the new White House administration. Um, that is the number two concern at a very high level. And number three is a slowdown in China, which probably delivers number one, which is another GFC. So they're worried about big, macro, cataclysmic events. Yeah? Low return expectations, high levels of concern, concern about things that are kind of scary, right? And so what that does is it makes it very hard to decide how to invest. If you've just not got a high level of hope for the markets, and by the way, these are online investors. These are people who, by definition of this survey, are bulls. You can't be an online investor and be a bear, right? So these are participants in the market and continuing participants in the market and these are the return expectations. So what's happened is that in the system, there's been a big, big build up of cash. Now we're looking at high net worth investors here because they were sort of easy for us to strip out. 
But what we see at the moment is that the amount of cash that high net worths in Australia are holding, that they self-describe as being excess cash, so above and beyond what they would like to have as their target asset allocation within their portfolio, they're holding 42% of that cash as excess. This is all money that would otherwise be invested but needs to find a home, needs to find an investment view that is suitable to investing. And right around the world, when we look at the brokerage markets around the world, everywhere we see the single biggest gap in the satisfaction of retail investors is this singular thing called trading ideas and strategies. People don't know how to take this cash that they know is excess and get it into a product. And I keep telling the guys at Vanguard, but I reckon this, their, their whole marketing line should be, don't know what to buy? Buy everything. Yeah? This is what's happening, is that we're walking into this, this environment where we're seeing the uh, in, very strong increase in the number of uh, investors in ETFs in Australia. So it's, it's almost fourfold in the last four years. We look at both who is investing in ETFs today and who intends to invest in ETFs in the next 12 months. And we also look, if you see that very light blue small bar at the bottom here, we also look at those who are intending to cease investing in ETFs in the, in the next 12 months. Now, what we see here is a few things. Number one is quite obvious, right? Very, very large levels of growth in the absolute numbers. Now, this is not a description of value. Some of these people will be very small investors. Some will be very large investors. They're just a number. The thing that is really different in this slide from every other marketplace that we look at is the attrition level. In most uh, products that we see around the world that you would describe as mature in their market, you see between 25 and 40% attrition rates. Part of that is driven by cycles of retirement and unfortunately death. Um, some of that is driven by the uh, sale and reinvestment in other product classes. But to be at only 14,000 people last year dropping out of a pool of 265,000 people is an extraordinary high sort of rate of stickiness. So people are coming to this product and they're staying in this product. And it's because it delivers the answer. If I have excess cash and I don't know what to buy and I know I need to be diversified because frankly Australians are well educated enough in investing to understand the sort of basics of Markovitz and the basics of portfolio construction. They know they need a number of stocks. So if it's hard to buy one, it's if it's hard to figure out whether I buy the CBA or BHP uh, or Woolies, uh, they're not recommendations by the way, um, definitely not, uh, then it's much harder to choose the 10 stocks that I need to buy or the 25 stocks that I need to buy. And so people are actively seeking diversification in this market. Um, this is a time series, but the relevant one is, is, you know, as you would expect, is the one to the right for 2016, where what's really driving the growth in ETFs in this country is just access to diversification. This is, you know, 70 odd percent of people saying that's the reason. Beyond that, access to overseas markets, which by the way is called diversification, particularly in an economy worth about 2% of the global market. And third is cost. And I find it interesting that, that so much of the discussion around the ETF product set is a cost-based discussion. And yet, actually the major attractions of this product, or this product class, is the diversification and the access to overseas markets. I can't quote a Nobel Prize winner, but I can quote my favourite client from my years as a stockbroker, who told me once, he was 96 years old, that he didn't mind losing a bit of money, but he wasn't going to pay some bastard to do it for him. And that's how we felt about Alpha. It's a very Australian quote. But it is very real. I promise you I didn't make that up. So, planners then are embracing ETFs. And one of the reasons that they're embracing ETFs is that actually they're not very hard to describe. Now, I don't say this to, to suggest that anything simple is the thing that people sell. Okay? But getting the connection between the client and what they want and the product and what it delivers is the key to a, an elegant discussion. Yeah? And so this is a measure of the amount of time that planners in Australia tell us that they spend having to describe various things. Now, it may not surprise you to know that um, it only it takes 11 minutes to describe a platform because beyond the words, well, it's a platform, it holds lots of stuff. It's not a lot to describe. 
But the next easiest thing to describe for them is ETFs. And look, just to uh, step aside for a second, managed accounts at the moment is 16 minutes, right? Except managed accounts is becoming easier and easier as planners get used to it. And the role of ETFs inside managed accounts is becoming more and more significant at the same time. So we see these two things happening. One is that ETFs are, are pretty easy to describe and to get alignment with the client. And the second is that the, the next emerging big sort of trend in the industry, which really is managed accounts, is equally going to feed the growth of ETFs within this country. That's not for me. So who amongst the issuer or the manager community is doing well? And, and why? And look, the answer is pretty simple, is that um, the ability to communicate these benefits to clients is at the core of the process, yeah? Planners have an enormous, I was preaching to the choir here, I should sit on a stool and sing. Planners have an enormous amount of complexity in their sales process. They have an enormous amount of regulatory compliance that they have to conduct. And they have to go through a process that I think many would describe as torturous in that environment, and then in the documentation of that discussion, the product that is easy to describe and easy to arrive at and understanding at with the client, it's no great surprise that that's the one that does well. And then it's no great surprise that the provider who assists the planner in doing that the best is the provider that's growing very strongly. What we have up here is um, a set of data that shows in the background the industry level of um, response and in the foreground Vanguard's response. Now, I said we're independent as a firm. We absolutely are independent, but this is what the data says, so we're happy to show it to you. We then use a statistical model to cluster these things. So you'll see on the right hand, yes, your right hand side, core, reputation and availability, advisor support, best product. We just, in, in very simple terms, we use a st statistical model that says, if a client says A, is there any greater likelihood that they would say B or D or K? And where we see those likelihoods emerging, we cluster them. So in here, we see these three issues around core, the core reasons around um, the, the, the value proposition of ETFs. But really interesting, down in the advisor support, what we see is that, that Vanguard is doing a significantly better job than the rest of the industry in providing advisor education, advisor support, and the BDM relationship, which I'm sure will please a lot of you. I think this industry has been talking about technology for so long, the BDM almost got forgotten. But the BDM absolutely matters in this world. So looking forward, uh, and just finally, planners tell us that they will absolutely continue to use ETFs. Now there's lots of models out there, as you know, whether this is used as a core product, uh, whether it's used as a satellite product, whether there's a portfolio-based diversification play going on and ETFs are being used in very specific ways or very general ways, doesn't much matter, actually. There's a very strong level of interest in continuing to invest in ETFs. And, and the strongest interest is in this thing called an active ETF. Um, Craig, I, I liked your uh, reticence around smart beta. Uh, we might talk about that on the panel. But there is a view, for better or worse, out there in the world that there are these things called active ETFs. Yeah? Uh, international equities, Aussie equities and fixed income are the, the sort of active product in the ETF space that are the most desired. You can see that the aggregate desire there, and this is after deduplication, is 52% of planners who intend to continue. Uh, this thing called passive uh, is really very, very strong as well. So we can see quite clearly when we talk to the advisor, uh, the financial planner community in Australia, that there is a very strong intention to continue to use ETFs. And in fact, that the role of the ETF within the advice and the planning um, relationship is, is evolving. Uh, the role of satellite is evolving both around active and, and a, a history of a lot of firms in Australia who've done that well. But there's also an emerging view that that the, um, I guess, more finely uh, carved out ETF products can also be used in the satellite uh, part of the portfolio as well. And so that's a very broad set of attractions. It's matched at the other end quite happily by a very broad set of attractions from the customers. And it really, as I said, goes right to the heart of diversification 
and access to international markets. And so we do believe that ETFs has got a very strong future ahead of it. And that's all I'll talk about for now, but we'll be back for a panel. Thank you for your time.